This is Dr. David Turner in his teaching on the Gospel of John. This is session number 15, The Farewell Discourse, number 1, Introduction, Foot Washing, and Betrayal, John chapter 13, verses 1 through 30. When we began our series of videos on the Gospel of John, we spent some time uh, showing the literary structure of John and how it is analyzed by uh, many scholars today as a book of signs up through uh, chapter 12, and then turning to chapters 13 through 17 as a book where Jesus uh, shows and teaches about uh, the glory of God. So we have the book of signs, the public ministry of Jesus, up through chapter 12, then the, the book of uh, glory, verses uh, chapters 13 to 17 preceding the Passion in John, which would be uh, chapters 18 through, uh, through 20. So we're right uh, between the uh, time of the Book of Signs and the Book of Glory. We've been looking at the Book of Signs. In our last video, we noticed how there's that rather uh, sad and plaintive word at uh, chapter 12, verse 37. Even though Jesus had done so many signs, yet they were not believing in him. Uh, thankfully, the few verses uh, following that uh, uh, relativize that statement a bit from the universal way that it sounds, and it does acknowledge that people were believing in Jesus. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the public ministry of Jesus has come to an end in the Gospel of John, and uh, things are not as we would, uh, as followers of Jesus, hope they were. Uh, many people had not believed in him, and many of the religious leaders of the Pharisees and of the priestly ar aristocracy had uh, you know, uh, redoubled their efforts <clears throat> to, uh, to arrest and to uh, execute Jesus. So uh, all this is not coming to Jesus as something of which he is unaware. So the rest of John is focusing on our Lord uh, preparing his disciples from 13 through 17 for his departure, which probably should not be understood as his absence or his total farewell from them, but... Uh, a very uh, somber and serious word about the way in which uh, God's presence with the disciples will be transformed from the physical presence of Jesus to uh, the presence of Jesus with the disciples uh, through the ministry of the parakletos, the, the helper, the comforter, uh, the advocate, the Holy Spirit. So we'll be looking at much teaching about the Spirit uh, in uh, videos to come from John 14 through 16, but this is our first video uh, on the chapter 13, so we're going to spend some time introducing uh, the uh, so-called upper room discourse, the farewell discourse, uh, whatever you prefer to call it, and then we'll spend some time looking at uh, how Jesus washed the disciples' feet. So we'll start off uh, this video by uh, a discussion of uh, just what the, uh, the farewell discourse is, is all about. So notice our first uh, uh, slide on, on the matter. Uh, it's not unusual at all for people to call this the upper room discourse. And in order to call it that, uh, one, one must uh, bring some information into John that is not in John. The upper room, of course, is mentioned in Mark uh, chapter 14 in Mark's Passion narrative, as well as in Luke's. And as you may recall from uh, the book of Acts, <coughs> disciples are uh, hanging out in that the same upper room, evidently, in Acts chapter 1, verse 13, uh, between the time of the uh, uh, ascension of Jesus and the day of Pentecost. Uh, John does say, of course, this discourse is, is in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is, is found, no doubt. But the, uh, the text in chapter 18, 1 speaks of Jesus uh, moving across the Kidron Valley. But other than that, uh, to, to the Garden of Gethsemane, but other than that, there is no, as far as I'm aware, that I've noticed at least, no further information about the location of, of uh, this, uh, this gathering. <clears throat> So I'm not so too uh, sanguine about us calling it the Upper Room Discourse. I guess in terms of overall biblical content, that's fine, but if we're just describing John, that's, that's not his term. Uh, another uh, term that's used to describe it, of course, is the Farewell Discourse. And this is probably getting uh, something that we're deriving more from the content of John, and I would say that this idea somewhat uh, fits the idea of John, but, but not totally, because there's no doubt that Jesus is telling them that he is leaving. He's departing and they can't follow him. So, so it is indeed a farewell of sorts. But Jesus is not saying to them that he is uh, leaving them alone. He's not saying goodbye to them in a sense of a finality that they will never, ever see him again in any sense. 
because Jesus makes it very plain in, in this passage that he will see them again, at least in some sense of the word, and that he will come to them. The question is, will he come to them personally uh, after the resurrection, or will he come to them through the Spirit to permanently until he does re, uh, come at eschatological times to, to judge the earth? So there may be as many as three ways in which Jesus could be coming to them as we look at it in this, in this material. So is it a farewell discourse? Uh, yes and no. Some have uh, described it as a, a testamentary uh, discourse. Uh, by the term testamentary discourse, uh, scholars mean that this material is, is Jesus' last will and testament, as it were. That he is uh, speaking to his people as, as if he were on his deathbed, so to speak. Much as, uh, as Jacob did that at the end of the book of Genesis, much as Paul wrote 2 Timothy in this sort of a way, perhaps 2 Peter as well in the New Testament is written with uh, this sort of thing in mind. Um, again, however, Jesus is indeed leaving, and his death is uh, the assumption here, I think. But uh, the, uh, there are some similarities, but I don't know that uh, we ought to call this a, a testament of Jesus, as, as some have done. Uh, Theologically, I think it's very important for us to notice, if we're going to stress the idea of his testament or his farewell to them, that he is absolutely uh, not abandoning uh, the disciples. <clears throat> He is uh, simply leaving, but he is sending another uh, helper advocate uh, to, to be with them who will, who will take care of them in his absence. And that advocate, that helper, the Holy Spirit, will uh, basically uh, modulate or transform the presence of Jesus uh, to them. And uh, Jesus will be speaking to them through the Spirit. And the Spirit is uh, Jesus' presence in their midst not metaphysically or personally, but the Spirit functions through Jesus as the one who reminds them of Jesus, who teaches them and reminds them of what they need to hear again uh, from Jesus and help them to remember what Jesus has taught. So you might say the uh, Holy Spirit is Christocentric. Holy Spirit is not uh, coming to them to uh, take them in, on to a new chapter, a new uh, departure from the teaching of Jesus, rather Spirit is coming to tell them about Jesus and to remind them of everything that Jesus has taught them so far. So with all that in mind, we, we could perhaps uh, describe the, the discourse not as the upper room or the farewell discourse, but instead as the transformation of presence until return discourse. But somehow that doesn't quite have a ring to it, so I doubt that's going to catch on. In any event, that's one way to, to think about the theology of what's happening in this discourse, whether or not it is a catchy term that we can use in the future. So first, some, some geographical material that will uh, perhaps help us understand what's, what's going on here. In Jerusalem, uh, we have the, the Temple Mount. And in Old Testament times, the hill to the south of the Temple Mount is called the City of David, uh, the, the oldest part of, the, of, of Jerusalem. And uh, this was often called in the Bible, I think, Mount Zion. Uh, however, uh, today there is another part of Jerusalem, the Western Hill, on the other side of the valley here, uh, that's called Mount Zion. And it's on this other uh, Mount Zion, this, this more modern use of the term, uh, where uh, much of the material that goes on in John 13 and in the synoptic parallels is thought to have occurred. Uh, the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, is uh, supposedly to be found here. And further on up toward the current Jaffa Gate is where the palace of Herod was, was believed to be, where probably the Roman governors hung out when they came to Jerusalem, where it seems to be most likely that uh, Jesus would have had his uh, hearing uh, before uh, Pontius Pilate. <clears throat> so this, uh, this area here in the western hill, what's often today called Mount Zion, perhaps would have been where, uh, from the synoptic tradition, the, uh, the last meal of Jesus with the disciples would have taken place. I suppose from here, Jesus would have uh, perhaps come over this way to get to eventually uh, to the, uh, the, the Garden of Gethsemane further north than where I had the pointer a moment ago. Of course, this is traditionally where Gethsemane is. There's some very old olive trees there that look quite gnarly, but how do we know if exactly where that was? So if we're to take this map <clears throat> and sort of tilt it back from the bottom to top, uh, we might see something that looks a little bit like this. This is looking at the, the modern Mount Zion, the western hill. And the installation here, the large installation, is called the Dormition Abbey. <clears throat> it's a place that uh, commemorates the upper room, supposedly. And uh, this is a traditional location that's not uh, necessarily historically uh, verifiable. And uh, evidently, the, uh, the uh, um, 
picture we're about to show you of the ancient paving uh, near what is today called the Church of uh, St. Peter Galicantu, which has a very odd sounding word having to do with the cock crowing, was perhaps over on the eastern slope of uh, this, this western hill of Jerusalem. So today if you visit this area, we'll see these ancient steps that uh, archaeologists have concluded probably go back to the first century to the time of Jesus. Looking up the steps, they look uh, like this. Looking down the steps, they look more or less like this. So if you go in the uh, uh, Dormition Abbey, you see a, a big, uh, beautiful room full of uh, nicely uh, carved stones that uh, have to do with the uh, um, upper room, traditionally speaking. There's a very interesting statue here of, uh, of, the, of the crow, which is uh, uh, <coughs> the crow, excuse me, the, the, uh, the rooster, the cock, uh, <coughs> which is uh, going to uh, crow three times. And uh, I think the picture here that's a bit hard to see is uh, Peter uh, having a conversation with the servant girl and uh, denying uh, the Lord. Uh, so uh, just a bit of uh, background information and foreground information about how the story is understood today, particularly if you are a uh, tourist in Israel. So in relating John 13 through 17 to the synoptic tradition, uh, we have some difficulties because when we read John chapter 13, verse 1, uh, the NIV translates it, it was just before the Passover festival. And so the meal uh, that is uh, being portrayed here in John is not necessarily being explicitly portrayed as a Passover meal as it is in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, some have thought that the reason for this is, is that in the Gospel of John, the pronouncement of John the Baptist about Jesus, that he is the Lamb of God, is taken so seriously that John does not want to have any other lamb, such as the Passover lamb, uh, even directly mentioned in John, but rather to focus all of the lamb imagery on Jesus himself. Uh, that is plausible, I suppose, uh, be, it, be it as it may, uh, what John is saying about this meal does not exactly match up with the synoptic tradition, and scholars who are able to deal with such things and have interest in it have written reams of material about it, and uh, fortunately uh, for you, I'm not one of them because we're not going to go into all that at this time. Not to make light of the uh, value of such work, but that's not what we're going to go into in the limited time available to us uh, in, <clears throat> in these videos. I suppose it's possible that John is operating from a different chronological scheme somehow and that he is describing the Passover meal here in uh, John 13. I suppose it's also possible that he is describing a different meal altogether that was the night before the Passover meal. It's, it's hard to say, and part of this, of course, is uh, tied to the fact that uh, as we read the synoptic tradition, there is a clear institution of the Lord's table from the Passover meal using some of the cups from the Passover uh, tradition to uh, symbolize uh, the body and blood of Jesus. But we have no such institution ceremony in John chapter 13. So uh, I, I think there is certainly room for thought here, various interpretations, lots of issues that come to mind, and I'm making you aware of those issues if you care to do further study and uh, research upon them. But just to uh, point out that uh, John's approach here does differ somewhat in terms of his literary agenda, his theological purposes from, from the Passover meal. This takes us back to uh, some of our earliest discussions about what kinds of books, uh, what kind of a book are the Gospels. So if they are books which are simply attempting to give you an exhaustive chronicle of all the events of the life of Jesus, uh, they have certainly failed in doing that but I don't think that's the kind of books they are to begin with. They're books which give us a selected historical traditions about Jesus, which are indeed true, but these traditions are uh, given because of their theological import, which is tied to the author's purpose, the message the author wants to get out, and then they are creatively uh, uh, taught and uh, written down in a, in a literarily excellent uh, manner. So history is not the only reason why we have these Gospels, which is not to say they're not historical. It's simply to say that they are more than historical. <clears throat> we have no mention, of course, uh, in the synoptic tradition <coughs> of the foot washing that Jesus uh, does here in John 13. Uh, we have the, the uh, bread and the cup ceremony, not the foot washing, uh, just the opposite of John. So when we observe the foot washing uh, tradition that's going on here uh, as in the context of the meal, you'll notice that we are told in uh, John 13 verse 2 the evening meal was in progress as, as dinner was, was going on. Uh, 
uh, Jesus uh, took time to wash the disciples' feet. So there is uh, some debate about whether the language of reclining that you find here in this chapter, and by the way, we're going to find uh, in the uh, ensuing chapter where uh, <clears throat> Jesus is anointed at Bethany uh, by, uh, by the family of, of Lazarus, what we're going to find there, there is a question about whether this is involved in what is often called a, a, a triclinium a meal. So the word triclinium is a sort of a Latinized form of uh, 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 words that basically mean three couches, three, three, three couches. So the question is that in ancient times, people of uh, some means for special meals would arrange a triclinium uh, in their homes. Uh, people who were uh, extremely wealthy would have a room in their house that was set up in this fashion, and they would tend to eat uh, more meals such as this. So this would be a, a beautiful dining room with a, a U-shaped uh, uh, table with uh, one table at the base and the other two being the upper arms of the U. And so they would eat lots of meals there. Typically, uh, they would have a view of their gardens from the room, or they would have beautiful uh, scenic frescoes uh, on, on the wall. And uh, they would recline typically on their left elbows and eat with their right hands, I suppose, unless they were uh, left-handed, then they would probably do it the opposite way. That would cause problems in the arrangement. So there are many New Testament texts which refer to this uh, style of, of eating while reclining, and uh, apparently all of these are referring to meals that are eaten in the uh, triclinium style. So I would say this is the uh, plausible background, and probably even more than possible to, to likely, of what we read in John 13 <clears throat> when we read about the Jesus having... Uh, announced that uh, one of the disciples would betray him and Peter wants to know uh, who it was and uh, starts to ask John. Uh, we see in verse uh, 25 that the beloved disciple, I just equated those two, uh, leaning back against Jesus, verse 25, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Uh, why would he be needing to lean back against him? Well, we obviously have uh, lots of... Um, pictures of the Last Supper of Jesus, this being obviously the most uh, famous of them all. And uh, apparently, uh, Da Vinci was betraying uh, the beloved disciple uh, as this individual right here, unless you have read uh, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code book. And if you have, then uh, don't believe anything that you read in there. That would be a huge mistake. But uh, the triclinium style of meal was probably something that looked a bit more like this. <clears throat> if you look at the... Uh, some of the ancient uh, dictionaries of Roman antiquity and uh, study a bit about the triclinium, uh, there is the uh, quotation in this particular uh, article that each person was considered to be below him to whose breast his own head approached, which is sort of a hard to understand sentence, but when you unpack it, what it's saying is that, as we just read in John chapter 13 and verse 25, leaning back against Jesus, what that's saying is that uh, every person that you would lean back against would be superior to you. So if you were uh, the person to whom uh, a person uh, who was leaning in front of you was uh, leaning back on to talk to you, then there would be a careful arrangement of those who sat at the table. So if I may perhaps just sort of lean myself for a moment here on this table uh, and in this fashion, I don't know if the camera can catch up to me, I guess we're good. Uh, then uh, I would be leaning like this and uh, eating in this fashion with my right hand. And then uh, however the uh, uh, status of the individuals in the, in the meal would be understood by the host, individuals would be arranged on, on, on down this way. So the person here would be a person who would be viewed as my inferior. This person would need to like lean back over their shoulder to talk to me. And of course, if I were, were leaning against uh, someone who was on my other side, that person would be viewed as being superior to me. <clears throat> so evidently, in some sense like this, when it says in 1325 that uh, the beloved disciple leaned back against Jesus and asked him who it was, uh, the, the person would have had to have gone something like this over his left shoulder or turning all the way around over his right shoulder to, to speak to Jesus. And this is likely what the text is, is portraying uh, for us here. So the triclinium meal, as it's portrayed in uh, this particular source that I found online, you can see the, uh, the address here if you want to check it out, says that at each of the tables, typically this is a way for, for nine people. I'm not sure how Jesus did it with uh, 12 disciples, perhaps four people at a table instead of three. 
that the person who is uh, first at each table, Latin would be sumus, a uh, person of uh, med medium uh, status in the middle, and then uh, emus would be the least person at each table. So the person of greatest status in the whole uh, banquet, the whole meal, would be the person sitting at this table because everyone else would be, in a sense, leaning back into this person's uh, presence. <clears throat> this is not exactly the way you often see this portrayed in different ways. The Last Supper, if indeed John 13 is the Last Supper, not the way you often see John 13 portrayed. Commonly you see John 13 portrayed with Jesus at uh, this table, which in modern Western uh, uh, culture would you tend to think of this as the head table. So Jesus would be in the middle, and uh, the beloved disciple would be reclining uh, against him. Let me get this straight here. Is that right? Yeah, so Jesus would be here, and uh, the beloved disciple would be here, I guess. And who the, where the rest of the people were, I guess, is, is not really made altogether clear in this. I've seen other images of it where uh, the priority is uh, started uh, on the left side and going around this way. But even when I've seen it this way, uh, Jesus is placed in the middle of this table with the beloved disciple in this, in this location. I have my doubts about that as well. So if, if this is correct, if this was the typical way in which things were ordered, then Jesus would have been uh, here at the number one as the most authoritative uh, person, the person of the most status. The beloved disciple would have been here where number two is, and then some other arrangement of the rest of the disciples. So whether we would have had the Judas somewhere nearby where Jesus could easily pass him a morsel, Peter somewhere nearby where Peter could more or less easily uh, say, Psst, John, who is it? Uh, find out. Um, it's hard to know beyond that. So there are other uh, portrayals of... Uh, Triclinia in ancient times. This is some sort of a, a wood cutting from the stone triclinium which is found at, uh, at Pompeii in the ruins of the uh, volcanic eruption uh, there. <clears throat> and I believe if you look around online, you can uh, see a uh, um, replica or you can see a picture of this uh, very, uh, very room. Uh, from, uh, from Sephoris, which is just north of Nazareth, uh, there is a floor mosaic which uh, portrays a triclinium in this fashion. This, of course, is not, strictly speaking, a uh, three couch, although it is a, a U-shaped affair. And there are more than, uh, there are not three people at, at each of these uh, low couches. So you see the people laying on their elbows here. Uh, you see the uh, servants who are evidently uh, taking care of, uh, of the victuals or the wine or whatever. And... Uh, there's no way to tell, I guess, from this exactly who is uh, viewed as having the most uh, status. A fresco also from uh, Pompeii uh, gives us another picture of it. In this one, uh, people are not seeming to be reclining so much as almost sitting at a, a higher table. So it's a bit different, uh, difficult from this to know exactly what's going on here. <clears throat> one image that uh, circulates online and I'm not sure uh, to whom to attribute it because I've seen it in lots of places and I don't see a copyright on it and I don't wish to make any money from it, but uh, here's a very common way that uh, it's portrayed. <clears throat> and uh, the beloved disciple is placed here with Jesus here and Judas here. So Peter, hearing Jesus say that uh, one of you will betray me, uh, somehow gets John's attention and uh, by jerking his head or something to... To, uh, to John is saying, uh, the beloved disciple, you know, ask him, ask him, you know, what's up, ask him. Uh, so in that case, Jesus would have uh, simply taken the morsel and handed it over his, uh, his shoulder back to Judas. The problem with that is uh, this would have made Jesus inferior to Judas in status if this arrangement were the way it was. <coughs> so what do we make of all this? Um, we know something of the custom. We have uh, varying uh, images of what uh, in ancient times the tables were set up to look like. We have differences of opinion as to uh, how things were actually carried out. We have a different number of individuals uh, at the banquet than uh, fits neatly into the three tables, each with three persons, uh, which uh, is seen as sort of the standard way of, of doing it. Uh, I'm not sure beyond just noticing that everybody was reclining in John 13 which of these arrangements would make the most sense. I tend to think that the principle that the person uh, upon whose chest you uh, look back at, upon whom you recline, uh, 
is your superior rather than vice versa does make a lot of sense. So if Jesus was viewed as he took uh, his place at the table as the head of the disciples and indeed uh, as he washed their feet, he refers to himself as the master, the Lord, if I, the Lord, have washed your feet. So it would make, make it only more fitting if indeed he had been uh, sitting at this highest place of uh, authority at the table. So using this image as, uh, as the way it would work, then Jesus would be where this image says Peter is, and things would have uh, then gone from the, le the greatest to the least in this order. The beloved disciple would have been the middle, middle person at this table, and I'm not sure exactly if Peter would have been next or where Judas was in all this arrangement. I think this goes beyond our ability to uh, know for sure. I'm sure there are various theories that have uh, more or less uh, clear uh, you know, reasoning behind them, so you can pursue this more fully if you would like. <clears throat> so now thinking about the, the discourse as a whole, not just chapter 13, how does this lay out for us? If you stop and think about it, you can see that the discourse sort of has a preamble and, and a postlude leading into the proper discourse, the discourse that's really a discourse. <clears throat> We're often told that the upper room discourse or the farewell discourse or the transformation of presence until return discourse, as I've termed it, uh, if that this discourse uh, actually is uh, not so much from all the way from chapter 13 through chapter 17 because Jesus isn't really talking in the first part of the discourse so much. He's giving the disciples an example here by washing their feet. And although he does say a few things in the process of that, he's not discoursing as it were. Uh, as you know, the discourse ends with uh, Jesus praying to the Father. A prayer is not a discourse. A prayer is his intercession, first of all for himself, then for his disciples, then for those who will believe in them eventually. So the discourse proper has to be really the section in chapters 13 through 16, and uh, where Jesus is uh, stressing the uh, coming of the Spirit. The discourse then begins in chapter 13. The very first thing Jesus is talking about is his departure, and that it's imperative when he leaves for them to love one another as he has loved them. In the midst of this then, I think he shows that he is providing for them the Holy Spirit who will enable them to love one another as he has loved them, all the way through to the end of chapter 16. Then in the prayer at the end of chapter 17, uh, he is praying for the disciples to be one as he and the Father are one. I think in a sense the, uh, the teaching about the new commandment that they should love one another as he has loved them, so that all men might know that uh, they are his disciples, is an interesting uh, way of starting the discourse. And the way in which uh, everything ends at the end of the prayer in chapter 17 is that uh, the disciples may be one as uh, he and the Father are one. That is an interesting way to end the disciples because just as in chapter 13, the, uh, the uh, love commandment is given so that <clears throat> everyone might uh, believe uh, that uh, you are my disciples, the unity uh, statement is made in chapter 17 at the end so that uh, all men might know uh, so that you are my disciples, uh, that, uh, that they might believe in me. So the, uh, the two uh, bookends, as it were there, tend to make a lot of sense as the, uh, the uh, way in which the whole discourse is framed. As we look through John 13 through 17, uh, there's not just a, a run, a, a, an unbroken line of words from Jesus. <clears throat> there is, of course, the, the foot washing in chapter 13, which will lead to some conversation with Jesus and Peter, and then later with uh, Jesus and the beloved disciple regarding the identity of uh, the betrayer. Even once you get into the discourse proper, if we want to call it that, from the end of chapter 13 through chapter 16, there are, are several uh, themes, things that we might call themes, most of which are uh, questions coming from the disciples. For example, in chapter 13, verse 36, uh, Peter asks a question, leading Jesus to make a comment. There are other uh, interruptions, if you want to call them that, from other disciples, 14.8, 14.22, and uh, Jesus uh, realizes in 16, 17 through 19 that the disciples are uh, wondering uh, what he's uh, thinking and uh, why, what is he actually saying when he says a little while, a little while? So there are some uh, interactive or dialogical uh, moments in the discourse. It's not just Jesus speaking with no interaction from the disciples. In fact, about uh, halfway through at the end of chapter 14, there is a change of location. 1431, Jesus says, get up, let's go. It's not exactly clear <clears throat> where they are going, whether he is speaking the rest of it to them as they walk or whether they've come to... Uh, a different, uh, a different place. 
chapter 18, verse 1 does say they, they, they left and they went across the Kidron uh, to, uh, uh, to the, the uh, uh, Garden of, of Gethsemane. 18.1, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with the disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. So wherever they were, they were uh, west of that. And on the other side, there was a garden. He and his disciples uh, went into it. So this would uh, help us then grasp the overall flow and structure of, of, uh, of the discourse. Looking now at John chapter 13 itself, as our habit has been, we'll talk about the way the context flows. <clears throat> we're given the, the nature of the setting of the meal in uh, the first three verses, and it's portrayed as being something that is uh, before the Passover, which is uh, sort of a, a difficult thing to understand exactly. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That part is not difficult to understand, given the way in which Jesus, the good shepherd, has cared for his sheep uh, throughout this gospel, as stated in chapter 10, particularly here in chapter 13. Uh, uh, it's, it's amazing that it makes this point. So 13.1, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world. And we already saw this expression in chapter 12 as well, that the hour had come. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That last expression could be understood in a couple of different ways. He loved them unto the bitter end of his ministry, you might say. Or you could take it that he loved them completely. He loved them to the very end. Uh, he loved them fully to the, to the nth degree, something along that line. So we're given the, uh, the act of foot washing itself in verses uh, 4 and 5. He got up from the meal. He took off his outer uh, robe, a garment, whatever, and wrapped the towel around his waist, pouring water into a basin. Evidently, he carried the basin around with him to each of the individual disciples, began to wash their feet, and dried them with the towel that was wrapped around him. When he got to Peter, uh, Peter, of course, being the person who often uh, talks first and thinks later, Peter probably gives voice to what all the rest of the disciples had been thinking. Why are you washing our feet? So Peter says to Jesus, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replies, you don't realize now what I'm doing. Later you will understand. Peter, realizing that the, uh, the situation is totally anomalous, uh, <clears throat> perhaps like Matthew's uh, version of the baptism of Jesus, where John the Baptist protests and says, you should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. Uh, Peter says, uh, no, you, you will never wash my feet. Uh, this is vintage Peter, isn't it? Uh, Peter never does things by half measures. Peter didn't say, are you sure this is the right thing to do? Uh, Peter said, no, this isn't going to happen. So Jesus replies just as forcefully, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So Peter quickly abandons his uh, previous strategy in verse 8 for a totally new one. Instead of uh, not having any washing at all, Peter now wants not just his feet to be washed, but his hands and his head as well. So you have to love Peter, don't you, when you see him jumping back and forth like this. I wish we had more Peters in the church today. I know I'm not one of them. Sometimes I wish I was. Jesus then explains uh, that those who have already had a bath only need to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean. So uh, here the symbol of foot washing, I think, moves simply from being an example of humility, which is why Peter protested. He didn't think it was right that Jesus should be washing his feet. Uh, now Jesus is showing him that it has more to do than just with humility. It has to do with cleansing. So the statement, you are clean, is, uh, is uh, followed by, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. So we have this sense of foreboding, this mysterious sense in which uh, cleansing is, is a part of foot washing as well, but it doesn't apply to everybody. And by implication, of course, it's talking about the, the one who will be revealed as the betrayer here in a moment, which is, was Judas. So when Jesus finishes the, the act of foot washing in the dialogue with Peter, he then explains to the disciples what's been going on here in verses 12 through 20. When he finished washing their feet, he put his uh, clothes back on, returned to his place, and he said, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me the teacher and the Lord, and uh, rightly so, for that's what I am. Uh, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I've set before you an example. You should do as I have done for you. 
Truly, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Interesting, in light of the repeated ways in which Jesus speaks of himself as the Father's messenger. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed. And he doesn't stop there. Knowledge alone isn't how you are blessed by God. You're blessed if you do what you know, which I think is a very good uh, thing to keep in mind for those of us who are uh, heavily engaged in academic work with the Bible, that the game that we're playing is not just the paper game. We're not just trying to get insight and information. We're looking for that information to, uh, to lead us to a, a way of uh, transcribing the character of God and living for God in our own lives. So Jesus makes it uh, very clear here that he is uh, providing uh, something for the disciples that should be an example or a model or a way that they should uh, follow in their own lives in the future, and they should uh, do it. <coughs> this, the, uh, this teaching then is uh, truly remarkable for us because none of us have the status he had by any means, yet we find it very difficult to humbly serve others and to take the role of the servant as he did here. Jesus follows this initial uh, discussion of the interpretation of uh, the foot washing by going into uh, uh, some foreboding words about the betrayer. Verse 18 uh, through 20, he says, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I've chosen. This is to fill, fulfill the passage of scripture. He who shared my bread uh, has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you'll believe that I am who I am. In other words, he's saying, I'm saying this to you already so that once things go bad, you realize it wasn't a surprise to me. I knew exactly what was going to happen. After he had said this, then verse 21, Jesus was troubled in spirit. And so we have more of the, the explicit announcement of the betrayal of, of Judas, which has already been alluded to in, uh, in a previous verse. <clears throat> verse, uh, verse 11, I guess, will be the previous verse. So he says it right out in so many words. Truly I say to you, one of you is going to betray me. Disciples are amazed at this and they want to know who Jesus is talking about. So Peter, by gesturing to John, evidently uh, gets John, the beloved disciple, I should say, to ask Jesus who it is. Leaning back against Jesus, verse 25, he asks him who it is. Jesus does not say in so many words who it is. Rather, he replies that it is the one to whom I give the piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. There is the practice perhaps in the Passover meal, and we're not clear that this is portrayed as a Passover meal, of uh, dipping uh, the bread in the bitter herbs, or also in the uh, uh, relish that is uh, made with honey. It's very sweet. I think the term for that is the haroshef. Uh, so it's not exactly clear what uh, is happening here in that regard, but dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, and as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. From previous uh, teaching about the betrayal, we know that uh, this is not a surprise. Uh, Jesus simply said to Judas, what you are to do, uh, do quickly. And no one around them knew exactly what that meant. Some thought that since Judas had the money, uh, that uh, he was going to go out and uh, buy things that they would need for the Passover. Or perhaps they thought that he was going to give an offering uh, for the poor. So we then have one of the darkest statements in the Gospel of John. As soon as G Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. So this will conclude our discussion of John 13. We'll come back now and talk about some of the further uh, things related to the Passover, but we'll pick up here at John 13, 31 in the next video because it is pretty much the introduction uh, to the rest of uh, the discourse. So when we think about John 13, uh, we have interesting art. There's lots of images you can find throughout history of how the way in which the portrayal of uh, Peter uh, talking to Peter. Here he is about to wash his feet. He has his uh, hands on his ankle, but Peter is uh, holding up things here by insisting that it isn't appropriate. So uh, uh, Bondone wants to uh, portray that in a 700-year-old in a uh, painting there. So now we come to the matter of foot washing and just think about it uh, in terms of biblical and cultural background. Uh, in the Bible, uh, <clears throat> priests were sometimes needing to wash their feet and, and their hands. But primarily, foot washing was not so much a matter of ritual purity for the rest of the people. It was a matter of, of hospitality. Uh, the famous text in Genesis 18, 
uh, which uh, alludes to the angel of the Lord uh, visiting Abraham and Sarah, uh, there is an offer of washing feet. And several other places in, uh, in uh, John, as well as in the book of the Judges, and in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, we get to the New Testament in Luke chapter 7. Uh, Jesus remarks that a wealthy person were who, in whose home he was uh, having a meal, that that person did not uh, wash his feet when he entered. Uh, in John 13, 1 Timothy 5 is a chapter about uh, widows and which widows are uh, uh, worthy of uh, church support. And in that chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 10, 1 Timothy, uh, Paul tells Timothy that widows who have... Uh, shown their uh, Christian virtue by showing hospitality, by washing the saints' feet, uh, are to be uh, uh, considered worthy of support by the church if they are in need. So there's a, a great deal of emphasis on foot washing in the, new t in the, in the Bible, including the New Testament. Uh, most of it seems to be just pretty much a matter of what you do when you have guests in ancient times walking around in uh, dirt streets. would have been quite a messy affair. You have lots of animals going up and down the streets, oxen, donkeys, whatever, and you walk through uh, piles of manure and things like that, to be honest, and so uh, garbage is strewn around, and so your feet are going to be uh, filthy uh, after being out very much, and so you, you, want to get, you want to get them clean before you can really relax when you come into someone's home. One would think that uh, someone uh, keeping a nice home would not want people coming in walking around with the messy feet either, so... Uh, although it's a great show of hospitality, it also is to the, uh, the homeowner's advantage to keep the feet clean of the guests. Uh, <clears throat> the betrayal that is portrayed here in John 13 is portrayed intertextually. Uh, and it's very interesting for us to take this passage in John 13, verse 18, and look at Psalm 41 in, in a way that is uh, somehow viewed as uh, uh, anticipating what happens in John 13, 18. The NIV translates it, uh, he who shared my bread has uh, turned against me. Uh, turned against me is a, a sort of a way of uh, uh, taking the metaphor of uh, lifted up his heel against me or uh, uh, kicked me in the back or something like that, uh, we, we might say. So this is a quotation from uh, Psalm 41 and I think it would behoove us to take just a moment to look at uh, Psalm 41 and see what is going on here and how uh, Jesus was looking at Psalm uh, 41. We hear people say lots of things about finding Christ in the Psalms and uh, the nature of the Psalms as uh, messianic documents. To my mind, a lot of this is rather uh, simplistically stated and people are looking at the Psalms as if they are sort of prophecies of Jesus. Uh, sort of uh, neglecting the immediate context of the psalm and its use in Israel's worship but not really taking it in its own right to, to much of an account. But when we turn back to uh, Psalm 41, whoops, I was in Isaiah 41, that won't work. Psalm 41. We're reading a psalm which is, uh, for the most part, I think, a, a psalm of uh, lament, a psalm where the psalmist is... Uh, complaining about those who are, who are out to, to get him. Uh, it starts off by, by blessing uh, uh, those who have regard for the weak and how the Lord preserves and protects them, verses 1 through 3. The psalmist then uh, prays, and this will perhaps be a bit shocking to you if you're thinking of this as, strictly speaking, a messianic psalm, a psalm about Jesus. The psalm then prays, Lord, have mercy on me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and will his name perish? When one of them comes to see me, he speaks falsely while his heart gathers slander, then he goes out and spreads it around. So the psalmist is essentially acknowledging his own lack, his own uh, sin, his own failure to fully uh, follow a God, but he also is aware that he has lots of people who are out to get him. So he talks a lot about his enemies. He says, they imagine the worst against me, saying even uh, a vile disease has afflicted him. He will never get up from the place uh, where he lies. In other words, his disease will be terminal. This leads us then to the verse that Jesus has referred to, Psalm 41, verse 9. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, someone who shared my bread, has turned against me. But may you have mercy on me, Lord. Raise me up that I may repay them. I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. 
Because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. So when we notice Psalm 41 in its immediate context, uh, the psalmist is acknowledging that he has lots of enemies who are out to get him. He's also acknowledging his own lack of perfection in his walk before God, but he's confident that God will save him from his enemies and uh, use him in future to, uh, to have a fruitful life. Uh, what is going on then when Jesus refers back to this psalm and picks this verse uh, that uh, my, my close friend has uh, lifted up his, his heel against me? I would have the viewpoint that uh, Jesus isn't regarding this psalm so much as a specific prediction of him as it is something that flows out of the life of the psalmist uh, immediately in that historical period and that in the providence of God, the betrayal that the psalmist felt has been uh, turned up a notch when it is applied to Jesus. In other words, all the betrayal of the Davidic figure who is in uh, Psalm 41, uh, that uh, that figure historically experienced is a betrayal that uh, really can't hold a candle to the betrayal that Jesus experienced. So Jesus is saying same type of thing that is happening uh, in Psalm 41 to the historical Davidic figure, whether King David or another Davidic related person, uh, is now coming back uh, in uh, an even greater way in, in the life of Jesus, who is, of course, the son of David. Jesus is the ultimate uh, Davidic figure. So instead of taking this as some sort of a uh, prediction, directly speaking, uh, and losing sight of its original context, I think we would want to notice the betrayal that went on originally historically, the effect that in the psalm is something that anticipates the betrayal that Jesus himself is experiencing at the hand of, of Judas. Now, all we know about this psalm is that uh, it is portrayed as a, a psalm of David in the, in the heading, but the headings are likely not uh, original to the psalm, although they have some antiquity. So if the psalm is related uh, to David in some sense of the word at least, whether it means that he wrote it or he approved it or it reflects ex experiences that he had as, as the king of Israel, we wonder perhaps whether it's referring to a specific incident in David's life. And although we don't know this for sure, it seems at least plausible to me that David is referring to the time period of Absalom's rebellion and how his advisor Ahithophel went over to be uh, an advisor to Absalom instead of sticking with David. <clears throat> you can read about this in 2 Samuel chapter 15 through 17, and especially interesting pieces that talk about Ahithophel are 15, 31, 34, 16, 20 to 23, and a few of the verses there in chapter 17. You may recall that Ahithophel's advice was accepted by Absalom for a while, but later on Absalom got some advice from a different advisor, and so he disregarded what Ahithophel told him. So guess what happened to Ahithophel then? He ended his own life by, by a suicide. Of course, this is exactly what happened to Judas. Is that simply a coincidence, or is that something that is significant in the providence of God as we interpret the scripture? So we're dealing with something here that uh, hermeneutics profs sometimes call typology, foreshadowing of New Testament events in Old Testament events. I like to think of it as uh, Jesus putting himself uh, through, uh, through the, uh, the beach, so to speak, walking on the beach of time and putting his feet in the footprints left by Israel in their own historical times. So whether you think this is a reliable hermeneutic or not, I think it is used sometimes in the New Testament to describe Jesus' relationship to David and to the Old Testament. And I think it is at least a plausible understanding here. Something was going on in King David's life, in a Davidic figure's life at the very least, a betrayal that Jesus is looking back on and thinking about. He evidently knows enough about Psalm 41 that he's interpreting what is happening to him now in light of what he sees happening to his Davidic uh, predecessor in, in the Old Testament. So Jesus is understanding his own life, his own betrayal, in light of betrayal that the uh, Davidic king experienced in Psalm 41. Whether it is the betrayal of Ahithophel, who betrayed David and then committed suicide or not, the text doesn't directly say. To my mind, at least, it is a, a plausible understanding of the passage. Give that some more thought. Come to your own conclusions. Finally, how do we take this foot washing uh, today? What are we going to do with this text in John 13, which uh, speaks of foot washing? Apparently, in the text itself, the text is a model of uh, humility, and humility uh, shown by reciprocal service. In other words, if we really care about one another and if we are people of true humility, we won't just talk about our, our humility, we'll serve other people uh, with our lives. 
we'll use up our life instead of doing something that will exalt ourselves, we'll use up our life's uh, energy to exalt other people and to help them. So Jesus, of all people, did what typically in ancient cultures a low person in the household or a slave would have done for the guests. Uh, Jesus himself took that role. And so that amazing thing that made Peter balk at first to getting his feet washed ought to show us just how important it is for us to, uh, as it were, uh, put on the towel and wash other people's feet. But there's another part of this foot washing that I think doesn't get uh, nearly enough attention. And that is that the foot washing is something of a, an act of cleansing. When Peter protests Jesus washing his feet, uh, Jesus acknowledges that there's something going on here related to cleansing. And Peter doesn't need to have Jesus wash him all over. He's already clean. All he needs is to have his feet washed. We wonder in light of that imagery whether uh, Jesus is speaking about uh, what uh, today we might call uh, uh, theologically progressive sanctification. Is Jesus thinking about washing uh, Peter's feet simply because he knows that Peter has already become a follower of his and has already become cleansed? He's had a bath, as it were, by his uh, conversion to following Jesus. Now all he needs to do is to uh, clean up his life from the difficulties that he faces and the wrong responses he makes in daily life. So is it possible that what Jesus is speaking about here is, uh, to put it into propositional terms, what 1 John is describing when it speaks about the believer in sin. Is Jesus perhaps saying something like it says in 1 John chapter 1, that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, uh, his blood continues to cleanse us from all sin. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us from sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Perhaps, perhaps not. You can think about that and see if you think this is a valid correlation of the text. In any event, Jesus does indeed speak of... Uh, of this in the sense of cleansing. With that in mind, I think there is a sense in which the foot washing is foreshadowing the cross. Uh, the foot washing in itself was not a redemptive event, but it was Jesus t doing an extremely humbling thing for the disciples. Of course, what could be more uh, humbling than foot washing? Not too many things. One of them would indeed be crucifixion, which as we note the way Paul puts it in Philippians 2 is about the most humiliating thing that one uh, could imagine uh, experiencing. So the foot washing perhaps is the foreshadowing of the cross. And I would think that when Jesus uh, in the next few verses after where we're stopping here today says to his disciples, I'm giving you a new commandment that you should love one another as I have loved you. How has Jesus loved the disciples? Well, the most uh, recent example of loving the disciples is washing their feet and showing them uh, by example how much they should love one another. And of course, we're told at John 13, uh, early on in the chapter, the first couple verses, that having loved his disciples, he loved them to the very end, to the bitter end, or he loved them completely. So his complete love for them didn't stop at washing their feet. His complete love for them certainly included washing their feet, but washing their feet was, uh, as I'm thinking here, uh, the, the last redemptive act that he did for them before dying on the cross. So what do we do about uh, foot washing today? How do we enact uh, this, uh, this uh, event uh, today? Well, well certainly uh, no one would gainsay the idea that we need to serve each other humbly. Instead of waiting to be served, we need to serve and to give our life a ransom for many. As, as Jesus put it about himself in uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Uh, we see churches which occasionally on uh, youth retreats have the young people wash each other's feet. We see uh, churches which uh, have clergy uh, uh, wash feet of people, uh, maybe once a year during the Passion Week, something along those lines. So it's something that is trotted out now and then as uh, something like a, uh, a drama in a church, uh, an object lesson that's played out to give people uh, not just a sermon, but uh, a demonstration of what they need to do for one another. I've even seen uh, foot washing being done at the recent weddings that I have attended where the bride and groom wash each other's feet. I've been to one where they even wash the feet of their parents, which was quite touching, although I have to say it took quite a while and made the wedding a quite long ceremony. But as you know, there may be uh, some amongst you who are aware of uh, foot washing as a normal practice in church, something that's put up almost at the level of baptism and the Lord's table. Uh, this is often done in churches which tie themselves to the Mennonite tradition, the Peach Church, Peace Church movement, uh, churches like that, where uh, probably once every month or every three months, uh, in connection with the bread and cup ceremony in the church, they'll actually have a ceremony where they wash one another's feet. 
I'm not personally convinced that Jesus intended for something like that to occur, but I'm uh, certainly not uh, convinced that there's anything uh, wrong with it either. And I think it might be a good idea for all of us to consider something like that because we need to be reminded of our need to serve one another in a humble way. As we conclude then our study of John the 13, let's hope that not simply the words of the chapter, but two a very amazing images are burnt deeply into our minds. First of all, that of our Lord setting his example for us by washing uh, our feet. And secondly, that of our Lord uh, showing who would be his betrayer. Hopefully, the more we think about to him washing our feet, the less we will need to worry about whether we are the one he was speaking of when he said, one of you will betray me. This is Dr. David Turner in his teaching on the Gospel of John. This is session number 15, The Farewell Discourse, number 1, Introduction, Foot Washing, and Betrayal, John chapter 13, verses 1 through 30.